I thought I did run in those this morning. I don't know that I'd put them on your face. <laughs> Just so you are aware. New York City streets. This Week in Gear is presented by Flipboard. So Meg, we should talk about the history of the Next Percent. Yes, so this is the second iteration of the Nike 4% essentially, and that shoe made huge waves when it came out a couple years sure. ago. $250 for that one, and it is a shoe that's basically been proven that you can, it will make you 4% faster. It will make you 4% faster. Yes. But the thing about these shoes that I think is fascinating is that they are, there's a finite life to them. 100%, yeah, with the, as we're talking about percentages, sure. with the 4% shoe, you can really only wear it, they recommended, for four or five marathons before the foam basically, its life is gone. Yes. That's, an, that's incredible. Yeah. But the foam is kind of what makes this shoe so special. Between that and then the carbon fiber plate that's like kind of in the middle here, you yep. can, what are the upgrades between the last Next Percents and these? Yeah, so with the Next Percent, they took into account Shalane Flanagan and other elite athletes like Elliot Kipchoge, who just won the London Marathon. Yep. And kind of like they asked for better traction on the bottom because it used to be super slippery if you're running in the rain and it was not great. And then this upper is totally different where a lot of what we saw with the 4% was it was this um, you know, fly knit material, which a lot of people like to run in because you can run with no socks, yep. which is great. But the upper would then hold sweat, and then if it was raining, like Boston Marathon two years ago, pouring rain, and it just did not hold up very well. So this is this new technology called Vaporweave, and Nike invented it themselves. It's their own proprietary technology, and it's based off of sailcloth. So it's basically like waterproof, breathable, mm -hmm. and it should dry and like wick away all your sweat. I will say after running in them, I would recommend wearing socks. Like I put really? them on without socks and was like, I don't know, it feels a little muggy. Like I don't think I'd want that. It feels a so, little muggy. Yeah. How many miles have you logged in these? Not that many because I will say they are super expensive yep. shoes. They're $275. And again, they have kind of like a half life. So you only want to use them when you're racing. So if you buy these shoes, I would recommend like save them for- The final run. Yes, your 5K, your 10K race. If you're training for a marathon, do your last you know 20 or so miles in them before and then race in them because you really don't want to waste them on like a run commute or you know your everyday like easy run. They're not for that. So okay, so give me give me a little bit of rundown on the specs. If I'm running in these in my final race at 26 some odd miles for a marathon, how much faster am I in these? Is it literally 4% or? Yes. So the reason they call these the next percent is they yeah. just cannot legitimately prove that it'll get you 5% faster. Sure. So it's somewhere between 4 and 5%. Obviously that depends on the type of runner you are and what your pastimes are and the shape you're in and everything like that. But supposedly they're supposed to make you more than 4% faster. More than 4% faster. Yes. Okay. Uh, are these available now to buy? They were as of last Sunday and they sold out essentially immediately. Yeah. yeah, so I would say look for them come June. They will be back out in the market. There'll be another drop and again, $275. I would highly recommend joining Nike Plus because then you get an update that you Good can call. buy them as a member. On the app. Yes, all, all through right. the app. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, Eric. For summer 2019, California based eyewear brand Jacques Marie Mage released one of the best aviators we've ever seen called the Roy. It retails for $8.75. Now that might be a lot for some people, but when you look at the details, it makes a lot of sense. The 1970s elongated style is made with four millimeter wide titanium frame, which is completely unique in the industry. It's crafted in Japan, features beta titanium nose pads that are engraved to stop slipping. Also, the temple tips are art deco inspired and feature hairline engravings and hand painted burgundy enamel tips. While the frame isn't currently on the brand's site, you can purchase it at Designer Eyes right now. So if you're looking for a slightly different aviator, something definitely more luxe, this is your look. This Week in Gear is brought to you by Flipboard, where quality content from the world's best publishers and storytellers of every type is curated and discovered. What you're looking at is a 1999 Ferrari F355, kind of. This is the F355 Modificata created by Jeff Siegel as a way to build the Ferrari into the exact sports car that he wanted to drive. At Monticello Motor Club in upstate New York, we got behind the wheel of the classic 90s Ferrari, now fitted with modern headers, radiators, gaskets, and wiring for increased reliability and durability, upgraded brakes and suspension for even better handling, and a roaring straight pipe exhaust that no one will mistake for a stock Ferrari. And 
around Monticello's fast technical racetrack, it gave us a chance to ponder the age-old question. Is it really possible to improve on a classic? Okay, is it fair to call this thing a resto mod? It is, yeah. Okay, so if I'm thinking a resto mod, I can't help but think of something like a Singer Porsche or an Icon. Mm -hmm. Singer Porsche though, I'm about to spend seven figures yeah, on one of those. It gets up there. And but the thing is, uh, Siegel doesn't he doesn't want to compete with Singer. Uh, he appreciates and respects the amount of detail that goes into yep. a Singer Porsche. I think anybody can. Sure. But that's why he keeps the modifications relatively simple, like just kind of the interior, suspension brakes, and under the hood. So you can keep it around that 200000 250000 price mark. He kind of just wanted to make it more reliable yep. and more durable yep. what the 355 is supposed to be, or what they would want it to be today. Like if they made the 355 today, Minus the straight pipes. Yeah, what minus the straight doing? pipes. Yeah. So it's more kind of like he wants to put it up against a secondhand 458 versus his car instead of clearly not going to a singer or going up against a <laughs> yeah, singer. Sure. So yeah, it's kind of in a different realm. Uh, something I want to talk about the interior, which we just saw, obviously. Yeah. Uh, one, first of all, cassette player, which is badass. Yeah, totally. But this interior, this interior is not what you see in a normal 325. What happened was he went down to the shop in, right down the street from Maranello in Modena. Um, where they source the fabric for the F40 interior. <laughs> and he went in there and he asked for a bunch of it, and they kind of didn't ask what he was doing with it. They just kind of assumed that it was going with an F40. Yeah. <laughs> so he was just like, yeah, I'll take a whole roll of it. So and now he has a bunch of excess F40 interior cloth. I was super intimidated going up to it, because yeah. it's, it's a V8 mid-engine Ferrari. <laughs> but the way he has it tuned and the way everything sits, it's so incredibly balanced. Mm -hmm. The first car I thought about when I was driving around was a Miata. Really? It's just that easy to drive. Because it's mid-engine. It's just balanced. so planted, yeah. All right. Fantastic. Thanks, Brian. Yep. Making pour over coffee at home, I like this method because typically uh, in the morning, I just want one cup before I rush out the door. With this method, you start off with the freshest beans you can buy. Uh, you can weigh the beans before or after, or you can skip weighing altogether if you're in a hurry like I always am. Bring your water up to temp. You want it to boil, and then take it off the heat and wait about 10, 15 seconds, you want your temperature down around 200 degrees and it boils at 212. The ratio that's recommended is about one to four uh, grounds to water, uh, about two heaping tablespoons that'll go in the filter. And then you just pour the water from your kettle into the filter and um, fill it up about twice to the top or until the mug itself is full. You can kind of lift up and check and you wind up with a pretty good cup of coffee. The Cosm chair will. Yes. This is the sequel to the Aeron, or is it a totally different uh, thing? That's how we like to see it. It is a totally different thing, but it's sort of like from 90s to 2018, 19, it is uh, the great evolution of office chair design, as nerdy as that sounds. I know, well, <laughs> we could talk about office chairs for far too long. The Cosm chair is new from Herman Miller. Yes. It is, uh, it's unique in that it has no adjustments. So right. let's talk about that for a second. So in previous office chairs, you know, from the 90s, the early 2000s, it was all about knobs and twists and turns and, you know, reaching under your chair and trying to figure out what everything does. Um, the Cosm is the complete opposite of that. There's one, there's one knob and it is going up and down. There's just still no solution for kind of figuring it up and down without actually touching sure. anything. So how does it know how far back I need to tilt to stay ergonomic. Once again, let's office chair nerdery. They use something <laughs> called okay. uh, sitting force, which in other words is weight. Uh, sitting, sitting force, force yeah. to uh, you, you essentially reach a fulcrum point, and the moment that you that the chair sort of catches you, it locks you in that fulcrum point. If you start leaning back, it adjusts a little bit and then locks you into a fulcrum point so you don't start leaning back too far or start swaying around. Anything. The other thing about this chair that's unique is that your feet will never leave the ground, and it's funny that we were actually talking about this, right. really talking about this before the camera. This is, uh, this is something that I think is it's difficult to sort of I see until you actually sit in a chair and you experience yep. it both ways. When you're leaning back in a chair and your feet come off the ground, you're breaking ergonomics, you're hurting your back, you're putting pressure on your neck, everything from from that foot mm -hmm. off the ground point to your the top of your, like just below your skull, basically, you're putting pressure on. This chair is the first chair, the per first passive ergonomic chair as it's known, to not lift those feet off the ground. And so while that may sound like a very boring feature, it's essentially what makes it revolutionary. So Will, you've talked about this chair quite a bit on Gear Patrol. Yeah, sort of ad nauseum since its release. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, part of the GP100 last year. Yeah, GP100, all sorts of reports, all sorts of comparisons. It's in our guide to best office chairs and task chairs. It's virtually everywhere on our website. Uh, as an Aeron owner, 
Why do I want to upgrade to the Cosm? I think a big part of it is, uh, one, we could talk all day about sort of like the yes, ease of going up and down and yeah. like being able to lift back. We could talk about our feet coming off the ground and all that stuff, but it's also just a beautiful chair. There's something to be said about it just looking really nice and it being sort of a little more elegant than something with uh, handles sticking out every which way of it. So in the 90s, when the Aeron became quite popular, it became sort of the dot-com throne. Yeah, understand. Uh, which is, sure. I think, your throne, uh, which is your word. This this chair had every adjustment you could imagine, mm -hmm. right? Everything from lumbar support yep. to high, uh, seat adjustments to arm adjustments. And now you've got the Cosm, which is basically sort of quote unquote magical, right? right. Requires no adjustments. Is this mm -hmm. where chairs are going? Um, I think for the foreseeable future, for sure. We've seen other notable brands in this space. Uh, Knoll, your all steel, steel mm -hmm. case, all these companies that sort of make high end uh, task seating also release chairs that are similar. Um, in my opinion, maybe not quite have matched this Herman Miller chair yet though. All right, so Will, what's the price on this thing? The Herman Miller Cosm, depending on what size you go with, how high your back want to be, it's going to be in between $900 to $1,500. Got it. All right, yeah. thanks, Will.